conversation. So now we're moving on to, and I realise I've made an error before I came here, I haven't asked pronunciation. And being Scottish and not from a Gaelic part of Scotland, um, I'm not helped here, but Kleina ni Hilakelig. Who will pronounce? <laughs> so we'll, uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Medicine uh, in TCD and a consultant in infectious disease and general medicine. She has a real interest in social exclusion on health uh, from a number of perspectives, uh, looks at health design and evaluation. But going back to the social exclusion, she's looking at how uh, systems exclude and why people become excluded with a special interest of in HIV and also has been looking at the effects of exclusion on COVID and that's what she's going to talk to us today about. Thank you. So thanks so much. I really enjoyed those two talks. They were both very uh, thought-provoking and I've loads of ideas. Um, but <laughs> I also could get a shotgun in the face during work just by working in inner city Dublin. So maybe my uh, kindred spirits are the rural practice. Um, so I'm the lead of the Inclusion Health Service in James's, which is a service specifically for people who are homeless, use drugs or otherwise socially excluded. Um, so yes. If anybody wants a hit on anybody, I probably have contacts. <laughs> Is this being recorded? Um, but I'm here to talk about COVID, uh, really, no. And obviously, my, my interest in COVID is around... Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, is, is around social determinants of health and COVID. So when COVID loomed up on the horizon back in what seems a long time ago now, early 2020, after I said, sure, it'll be less serious than the flu. Um, was wrong on that one. Uh, we, myself and, and the other people that I work very closely with, GPs, nurses, uh, other uh, hospital practitioners, we were very worried about what was going to happen with COVID and, and our homeless patients um, in particular, because I think um, experience shows us that, that poverty kills and the poorer you are, the more likely it is to, is to kill you and people who are homeless or otherwise socially excluded live in pretty extreme forms of poverty. And this isn't a new thing and I was fascinated. So this slide is actually from a talk I gave uh, earlier this year in June and I had this image. This is a cholera epidemic in Ireland and when I was on the train on my way up here, this is actually Sligo. Um, so this was the cholera epidemic in Sligo. So it's not a new story to, to think about diseases and particularly infectious diseases and poverty um, and the heartbreak that that brings to people. This is a, a really sad image to look at. Um, and some of that is down to kind of physical conditions. Uh, so this is the famous water pump in London and um, that this, uh, John Snow is his name, he was a public health doctor, I think, and he tracked to see, he mapped out, looking at data, as Mike said, you know, data is powerful, especially if it's somebody who's actually interested in what the data shows, who's, who's generating the data. So he tracked out where people were dying of cholera in London, and he could spot that it was some of the water pumps, some of the areas where the sewage was feeding directly into the drinking water that were, were the problem. So we know about the physical kind of interactions between poverty and infections. But there are also ones that we don't understand, and this is somebody dying from, from TB um, in the 18th so TB used to kill one in seven adults in Western Europe right up until the end of the 1800s, so not very long ago. Um, and it's really interesting. So TB started to decline long before there were vaccines or antibiotics for TB, and we don't really understand why. Science, medicine, nobody really knows. It's a really, really interesting question, not just about housing, because there wasn't that huge of a shift in housing or environmental conditions during that time period. So we know that poverty kills, and a really nice outcome measure, not patient, well, sort of patient reported, is a standardised mortality ratio. So how likely you are to die at any given age? It's a real hard binary number. And this is data from England and Wales, but it will be the same in Scotland, the same in Ireland, the same in any rich country. If you live in a poor part of London, um, or a poor part of Dublin, or a poor part of Sligo, you're twice as likely to die at any given age as you are if you live in an affluent part. So it doesn't matter. If you're 18, you're very unlikely to die in the next year. If you're 98, you're quite likely to die in the next year, but you're always twice as likely if you're poor. And where that's known as the slope index of inequality. So when people think about this, they tend to think about the things that are driving it as smoking, exercise, you know, how your lifestyle, and I always put that in inverted commas because they're not really lifestyle choices. I, I would take issue with the choice. But actually, if you correct for all of those variables, we only correct for about a third of that difference. So again, that difference, what poverty is doing to people, we really don't understand it as scientists and clinicians. Um, and where I work is, is out on that edge. So this is looking at people who are socially excluded. And I've used that term already. They're people who 
really are very much on the margins of society. So in Ireland, we would be talking about travellers, um, we would be talking about people who inject drugs, people who've been in prison, people who, who engage in sex work, people who have severe and enduring mental illnesses like schizophrenia. Uh, and it's different in different settings. So in Australia, it'll be Aboriginal populations. In Scotland, it'll be pretty similar to, to our populations. It's different depending on where you live. But you can see the mortality effect goes right up. So it's about tenfold higher and it's worse for women than men. And that's consistent between studies. Women usually live longer than men, but once you're socially excluded, women die younger. So the average age of death for a homeless woman in Dublin is 38. The average age of death for a homeless man in Dublin is 44. Both shocking numbers, but again, scientifically and kind of, you know, interesting, uh, why, why is it even worse for women? So that's, there's a slope and there's a cliff edge and we don't really understand either of them. So what about COVID? So of course I was, you know, predicting, I hope somebody's looking at poverty and COVID or education or any other of the proxy markers that we have for poverty to look at it. And at the start uh, in Ireland, it was actually the affluent areas that had it. And that was purely because it was picked up on skiing holidays. So that was an artifact. This is why I don't always believe your data as, as, as showing exactly what you think. But when bigger studies went on, this is really nice. So education is a really good marker for social status. More education you have, we probably are all up in that lovely, uh, you know, postgraduate, college graduate, postgraduate degree. We're protected from loads of things. But you can see no matter what race you are, because race is also important, this is US data. The more education that you have, the less likely you are to die from COVID. And that's happening in two ways. One is exposure. COVID is acquired by breathing it in. And how likely you are to breathe it in depends on where you live and how you work. Um, and so this is the housing crisis in Dublin. Hopefully it's not as bad in Sligo, but it probably is. People are living in horrendously overcrowded accommodation. If you share with four people, the likelihood that one person in there has COVID is four times higher than if there's one person in there. And also your job. Um, and this is really interesting. So if you think of the people that died from COVID during the pandemic, healthcare workers in Ireland, they were predominantly cleaners, healthcare assistants and security staff. So the lower paid end of, of things. And this is... Uh, data from James is on the top and Galway on the bottom from that first wave of COVID. And you can see that HCA, so healthcare assistants, the kind of lowest paid, lowest status job in a clinical setting, they had the highest prevalence of antibodies. So you're more likely to get exposed to COVID in your work. You're physically closer to more patients for more of the time, probably. Then when you get COVID, some people don't even know they have it. Some people get very sick and die. There are a number of factors that, that affect this, including vaccination and what strain is circulating, but there are lots of variables that are to do with the person that gets it. And you can see here that even if you get, if you get COVID, if you're a consultant or if you're a healthcare attendant, your likelihood of dying is different depending on your poverty levels. The poorer you are, the less education you have, the more likely you are to, to get hospitalized or die. And this is our own Irish data. So you can see that this is severity with uh, red being the most severe. And you can see education there. You know, people who are university level were much more likely to have milder forms of COVID. Obviously in Ireland, that's very age driven. Big difference between my grandparents' generation. My grandparents left school at 12 and me, you know, I'm probably not done doing formal education yet. Um, so, so, but even when you correct for age, that remains. So something about people's social setting, their social status is affecting it. So what do we think is happening? So this is really interesting, and this has actually changed since I was in medical school. So when I was in medical school, it's very much genetics was about what you inherited from your parents, right? You know, you get a gene for Huntington's disease and you get Huntington's, or you get a BRCA and you get breast, you're more likely to get breast cancer. But we know that the environment has a really big role in causing disease. And how that happens is through epigenetic modifications. And how I tend to think of this, it's like a recipe book. So your genes are like a recipe book, but you're actually only gonna cook a few recipes from that nice big recipe book. So the epigenetic regulation is what recipes are you actually going to make? And that is to do with your environment. And what I think is fascinating and isn't that well known is your social setting has, it plays a big role in regulating what recipes you cook, what genes make proteins. So this fish, and a fish aren't particularly sociable animals, this fish lives in a lake in Lake Tanganyika in Africa. And in a set area, say the size of this lecture theatre, there's only one dominant male fish, and he's that stripy guy. So he's aggressive, he's fertile, and he's brightly coloured to attract the ladies. He's whizzing along in his Ferrari, breaking the speed limit. I would say, girl, you need to stay away from him. He's not good. But anyway, he's, he's the only fertile male fish in that pool. And all the other males are non-dominant. And they're the, the guy on the left. He's nice and chilled, hanging out. Um, 
But when the male fish dies, because he's brightly colored, the seagulls or whatever birds see him more easily, so they keep picking out the dominant males and eating them, one of the non-dominant males will change what proteins they're making from the same genes and transform into the Mr. Alpha male, driving his Alpha Romeo fish. So in fish, social settings can change what genes and how you look and, and your biology. And humans are incredibly social animals. This is my friend's baby. I just love looking at this picture. So I have it up there because she's cute. So the first thing that humans learn how to do before we can control our hands or move or you know, bring food to our mouth is to make eye contact and smile. And that's because for our survival as, as primates, we need to be able to be part of the social crew because we need to be taken care of. So that's how much we prioritize social behavior in in human development. Um, so I think there's a huge field that's going to open up about how our social status, how, how we feel cared for, how we feel part of the community affects our biology. There's a little bit of work in monkeys. Monkeys are nice because they don't drink or smoke. Um, so you can factor all of that out. But these are female um, macaques. And depending on the scientists moved the macaques into a, a group in which they were either bottom of the pile or a group in which they were top of the pile. And you can measure that by how much of the time your fleas get picked out by compared to how much time you have to pick out the other monkey's fleas. So I think that's so cool. Apparently gossiping in humans is the equivalent of picking out fleas in, in uh, monkeys. But so depending on where the females, the monkeys were in the social hierarchy, they changed their immune system. So the monkeys that were kind of bottom of the social rank were feeling excluded. They had chronic inflammation switched on, antiviral immune responses switched off. So what is that going to cause? Isn't it cool? And that's, I think, why uh, in cancers, a lot of HPV-related cancers are, are very socially patterned. I think it's probably to do with HPV clearance. And it's the same in mice as well. And it affects behavior. So all of that, you know, do you do your exercise? Do you go to your GP? Do you have that zip? A lot of that is socially patterned. Um, so I think sometimes when we blame patients, it, it maybe illustrates that we don't understand the biological data. So we know in COVID, inflammation bad. Inflammation is what's driving severe COVID. Antiviral immune responses are good. And we think that that's, I think that that's what's happening. And that's why people who are living in poverty are more likely to get sick um, with COVID. And that means that things like really successful response to, to uh, COVID in, in homeless services in Ireland, they were taken out of the hostels and put into hotels and supported and it prevented a lot of deaths. So it's a good guide to us for, for where as a society and a healthcare system we need to put our um, effort so now I just want to talk a little bit about vaccines, because I think this is, for me as a scientist, this is so cool, right? Everybody is getting the same amount of immune stimulant. So we got very excited, except when the government decides to give different people different vaccines, which was very annoying. But we managed to do this anyway. And Connor, who's my PhD student, um, looked at uh, immune responses based on... Um, people's adverse childhood events. Does everybody know what they are? Yeah, and kind of childhood trauma, um, which not surprisingly map onto their socioeconomic status. And we have three groups, high SES, doctors, nurses, physios, OTs in the hospital, because they were handy, low SES, porters, cleaners, catering, admin, people who didn't need a tertiary degree for their job, and socially excluded who were, uh, we went out to some of the homeless <coughs> services to recruit. And what you can see is there's a difference in IgG and antibody responses three to four months post-vaccination. And you can see in, in graph B there in the middle that it's, it looks like it's patterned by adversity. So people who had third level education had the highest amount of antibodies. People who didn't have third level education but had a job were in the middle. And then people who were socially excluded had the least. Um, and this is really important in terms of looking at national vaccine policies, for example. These, you know, in terms of prioritizing who needs a booster, I think we need to recognize these social things as equivalent to, you know, having diabetes or having another medical condition. And this is looking at it in a different way. So this is looking at interferon gamma release assays. My PhD is in immunology. Don't let me bore you because literally you'll be there years later. But uh, this is basically how well the cells respond, the, t the, the T cells and the B cells, when you put... COVID on. So the cells respond better in people who've had, who have more, who are more affluent, who have more education. Long COVID, I think we're all, a lot of research energy going into try to understand that. Um, and it looks like there may be an association between lower socioeconomic status and long COVID susceptibility, which would make sense that chronic, those inflammatory pathways being altered. Um, so in summary, poverty, and social exclusion, which is poverty on steroids, 
uh, don't only affect exposure to infections, but they also affect immune responses and make, us, make some people who have less more likely to get very sick with infections, particularly viral infections. And we don't really understand how. So it's a, as my little, littler son would say, you just cliffhanged me, mommy. Um, so I'm cliffhanging you because we don't really understand the mechanism. Great. And I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Wow, that was really fascinating. So I'm going to um, inhibit myself and put the questions <laughs> to the floor first. Okay, so who has questions? We're going to the shelter. Um, I'm just sitting here in awe because I'm a stats person and that's crazy. Um, Isn't it? And nobody ever looks at it no. like, oh my God, if I see another paper that didn't look at socioeconomic status, yeah. I'm going to scream. Well, we always <laughs> include it in the health economics perspective. There you go, it's yes. Important. Yes. But, um, wow, I mean, that, that is, that is, yeah. I'm wondering, is, it, is there a kind of a, a, a mitigating factor of the more educated we are, the more aware of being healthy? Is, I mean, is, is there something in the line of investing in education gives us a better perspective as to how to remain healthy so our, immuno, our immune systems are stronger? Is that a possibility? So I think in some of the work, yes, but like say in the, in the macaque studies in monkeys and that, no. So that's purely just, you know, social rank mm -hmm. and biology, like straight through to, to immune system regulation. I think we don't really understand what the psychological effects are going between the poverty and yeah. or social exclusion and ill health. And a lot of it is to do with locus of control and emotional regulation and all those type of things. And they can come through education. So absolutely, it probably does play a role. And there's a lot of data showing that if you want to try and narrow that difference, where you go is early childhood education. So it's, it's yeah, I, I think though it's not just knowing to take your vitamins, because even if you correct for all of those things, you still see a difference. Yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating. It's, a, it's really interesting. I think, obviously. <laughs> okay, thank you. It was a really nice presentation. Uh, my name is Mulekan. I'm doing my PhD on the same title. My study title is The Impact of COVID-19 on Non-Communicable Disease uh, Patients, uh, specifically in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Excellent, really important Yeah, work. some of, uh, yeah, a majority of the contents are in line with uh, my study. Uh, in th that's particularly in the developing country, but I also uh, got some uh, different results, some surprising results. For example, in the first four months of uh, during COVID-19, due to lockdown and sanitation, the mortality rate, general mortality rate in the, in the population of specifically in Ethiopia was decreased because majority of the patients who, who are uh, under that country where we're dying because of uh, communicable diseases. So due to sanitation and those measures, the prevalence of communicable diseases were decreased. As a result, the mortality rate is decreased. So we saw exactly the same thing in homeless people in Dublin and people who inject drugs around methadone. Mortality decreased because suddenly they were in appropriate accommodation with methadone and appropriate supports. It's really interesting. It shows what you can do, right? You know, there's all these things that, oh, we can't fix that. But sometimes when there's a pandemic, people are like, okay, right, we can fix it. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and probably, I don't know, but is there much mortality and injury from like road traffic accidents yeah. and stuff? So probably people staying in their yes. own home reduced, yes. reduced some of that. The second most, um, among the top tens, uh, I think the seventh was road traffic, road traffic yeah. accident. So that also dropped yeah. in the in, in significant amount. And uh, relating with educational status, my study shows that people who have more education has more stress about COVID-19 than uneducated one. Because they follow the news, they have internet, mm. they have everything. So uh, that's uh, also, do you have any findings that, like this? No, we didn't really. And, and that's why I'd love, like this is my dream, at some point to look at, you know, in the global south, um, in Africa or, or in Asia, countries where, for example, like what, what somebody who considers themselves poor in Ireland may physically own may actually map to somebody who considers themselves quite affluent somewhere else. So it's really interesting to look at those differences in, I, I think it's really important to, to match this work. Some of the data I showed was from Mexico and South America, so in kind of like intermediate um, level, and they still had a big difference by, by education. Yeah, it's interesting.
Just as someone who's worked at the vaccination programme, it's highly fascinating data. And I'm wondering, have you fed back to the national lead in the vaccination programme? And will there be a targeted campaign as a result of this research? So, there, yeah, we were really lucky. There, we were able to feed straight back into NIAC and, and then homeless people got prioritised for that first, you know, high risk groups, which was brilliant. And there was a really good campaign. There's a great network in, in Dublin and in Cork and in many cities in Ireland of people who work in kind of very socially excluded groups. And um, so we had a vaccine drive that was, uh, there was a bit of bribery, sausage rolls and croissants. And there was a bus that went around to all the hostels and there was 70% vaccine uptake, which was phenomenal. And that was great. And I think that was also because we knew that people were getting really sick. So we were able to say, this is a really important group to focus on. And maybe the advantage of a smaller country, I think they weren't able in the UK, you know, or in England to, to have that rapid loop to be able to say, listen, we really need to sort these guys out. But yeah, there were really few deaths. I think there were less than 10 homeless deaths in the first wave of COVID, which was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I know that you also yeah, have to rush I for do. a train. So uh, as much as, again, we have lots of questions, I think we'll have to stop there and move to the next speaker. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. And I've